In this video, we're going to add some movement to our pawn static mesh to give it a bit more life. While this is animation, I don't want it to be confused with skeletal animation. That's a very different topic where you rig and deform a mesh using a variety of tools. For this video, we'll just be doing a little math to move the entire static mesh around. I'll be building off the Flybot project I've created in previous videos. There's a link for these down below, as well as a link to the project files on GitHub. In a previous video, we left off with the pawn being able to fly around the world, but it's always in the exact same position on the screen. The first thing I'd like to add is the ability to change where the camera is relative to the pawn. This will allow you to change between first and third person views. To do this, we're going to bind the mouse on the scroll wheel to change the position of the camera. The camera attaches to the pawn through a spring arm component, so this input will change the maximum length of that spring arm. When the spring arm length is zero, the camera will sit right at the front of the pawn, but when the length is greater than zero, it will sit further back, allowing you to see the pawn in the frame. We'll go to Visual Studio and open up FlybotPlayerController.h. We'll add a new input action called spring arm length action. In FlybotPlayerController.cpp, we'll first allocate this object, set it to be a one-dimensional input, since there's only one float value we need to track, and then bind this to the mouse wheel access input. In FlybotPlayerPawn.h, we'll declare a function to handle this new input called update spring arm length. We'll also declare three new properties in this class to control the sensitivity of this input, as well as the min and max values of the spring arm. In flybotplayerpawn.cpp, we'll first set some default values in the constructor for the spring arm. In setup player input component, we'll bind our new spring arm length action to our update spring arm length function. And then at the bottom of the file, we'll define our update spring arm length function. We'll first update the spring arm length based on the input value, as well as the scale variable we added to control sensitivity. We'll also multiply this by the delta time, which is the amount of time that passed since the last frame, so the input feels consistent regardless of our frame rate. We then make sure that the spring arm length doesn't go below the minimum length or above the maximum length. If you build it, run it, hit play, and then use the scroll wheel, you can see the camera adjust accordingly. Having it on the scroll wheel allows you to change your view easily, depending on what you prefer and where you are on the map. The next thing I'd like to add is a little up and down movement to the pawn, so it gives a sense that you're floating. Let's first review how the pawn is set up. At the root is the collision, which is invisible. Under that is the body static mesh, and then under that is the head static mesh. This allows us to move the head separately from the body. We also have the spring arm and camera components connected to the collision component. This allows us to move the static meshes around within the camera frame, but without moving the actual camera. To do this, we'll first open up flybotplayerpawn.h and declare an override for the tick function. And then in flybotplayerpawn.cpp, we'll define the function at the end. We'll first run the parent tick function so it can run any code it needs to. We'll then check to see if Z movement amplitude is set to something other than zero. This is a variable we'll define later that tells us how far to move up and down. To move up and down smoothly, we'll use the sign function and pass in the amount of time that's passed since the pawn started ticking. We'll multiply this by Z movement frequency, another variable we'll define, to determine how fast or slow for it to move up and down. We then multiply the return of the sign function by the amplitude to get the total Z movement. We then set just the Z value for the location of the body static mesh. We also add an optional Z movement offset in case we want the body to be offset from the collision. Next, back in flybotplayerpawn.h, we'll declare these new Z movement variables. And then back in the flybotplayerpawn.cpp constructor, we enable ticking for this actor and also set some default values for frequency and amplitude. Let's build it, run it, and then open up the Flybot Player Pawn Blueprint. If you click Simulation, you'll see the pawn starts moving up and down. If you stop the simulation, increase the amplitude, and then start it back up, you'll see the pawn moves up and down much more now. You can also change the frequency to make it move up and down much faster. We'll keep the default values for now, and then hit Play to test it in the world. As you can see, the small amount of movement gives the pawn a bit more life. One problem is that when the camera zoomed all the way in, the front of the body now moves up into the frame. To fix this, we'll open up the player pawn blueprint, select the spring arm component, and then move it forward slightly. When we hit play to test it, you'll see this is enough so that the body no longer comes into the camera frame. The next thing I'd like to add is a little tilt to the pawn body when we change direction or move side to side. To do this, we'll first open up flybotplayerpawn.h and add some new variables to track our tilt. Tilt max will limit how much our pawn can tilt in degrees. Tilt Move Scale determines how much our movement input adds to our tilt, and Tilt Rotate Scale determines how much our rotation input adds to our tilt. Last, we have a private Tilt Input variable that tracks how much tilt to add during every tick. In flybotplayerpawn.cpp, we'll first set some default values in the constructor. Next, in our Move Input function, we'll multiply the Y value of our input by the Move Scale variables and then add this to our tilt input. 
and then in our rotate input function, we multiply the yaw value by the rotate scale, and then add this to the tilt input. And then down at the end of our tick function, we'll add some code to handle our tilt input. First, we'll get the current rotation of our pond's body. Next, if the tilt input has been set, we add this to the roll of the rotation. Next, we check to make sure the roll has not gone beyond the tilt max for each direction. We then set the tilt input to zero to clear it for the next tick. Last, we set the pond's body to this new rotation. We also use the roll as the yaw rotation for the head to make it look like the robot is looking left or right. If we build it, run it, and hit play, you can see the pond body tilts left or right, and the head also looks left and right. This works with both the side to side movement as well as when we change direction. One thing that's missing is that when we're done moving or rotating, the tilt stays there. It doesn't move back to the center. To fix this, let's first open up flybotplayerpond.h and add a new variable called tilt reset scale. This will be the amount to adjust back to the center during each tick. In flybotplayerpond.cpp, we'll set a default value for this in the constructor, and then at the end of the tick function, we'll add some code to apply this reset. It checks to see if we're off center in either direction, and if so, adds the reset value to move back towards the center. If we build it, run it, and hit play, we'll see the pond now tilts back to the center after we stop moving or rotating. This looks a lot better now, and gives the pond some nice movement as we fly around. There's one other feature built into the spring arm component that I also experimented with. This is camera lag. Open up the player pond blueprint, select the spring arm component, and then scroll down in the details panel until you get to the lag section. In here, you can enable both movement and rotation lag. If you use the defaults for both, it definitely feels a bit wild as you fly around. Since this was a bit too much, I went back and tightened up both the movement and rotational lag. I also set a max distance on the movement lag so it wouldn't drift too far. This was definitely still noticeable, but it felt a lot better than the defaults. While I did like how this looks, I think I still prefer the precision you get without the lag. For now I'm going to disable it, but later on I'll probably add it as an in-game option you can enable. Another option I experimented with was motion blur. You can find this by opening the player pond blueprint, selecting the camera component, and then scrolling down to post processing, rendering features, and then motion blur. By default it has a value of 0.5, which is pretty noticeable. If we set this to 1, hit play and move around, you'll see it becomes much more noticeable. If instead we go back and set it to 0, you can see everything looks very crisp. There's no blur whatsoever. After experimenting a bit, I decided I liked a value of 0.1. It's mostly sharp, but has a little bit of motion blur added. This is another option that we'll probably want to put in-game later on. But for now, we'll use this as a default value. The last thing I did was open up the Flybot Player Pond constructor, and add default values for everything that have changed in the Player Pond blueprint. Now, you don't need to do this, but I like having a copy of everything that I've changed inside of the C++ code. This allows you to easily see differences between versions and Git, which you can't do with the asset file since they're binary. In the next video, I'm going to start looking at networking and how to make this into a multiplayer game. If you have any questions, be sure to ask in the comments down below. Thanks for watching.